When Stephen King writes, there are other words than these. He's quite literally referring to the multiple parallel realities of his epic The Dark Tower series, including metropolitan New York, the dystopian sci-fi spaghetti western landscape of Gilead, and any number of stops in between. That said, he can just as easily be commenting on our own present moment in time. From dystopian futures to escapist fantasies, the possibilities of virtual and augmented reality are often misrepresented or misunderstood. Today, we'll explore how these technologies actually deepen our connection to the world around us. While we often think about them as emerging technologies, virtual and augmented reality have existed throughout modern civilization and arguably beyond. And yes, AR and VR as we conceive of them today were largely imagined in futuristic science fiction texts like William Gibson's Neuromancer and Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. However, fictional books in general and oral storytelling before them have long created virtual worlds from whole cloth. While socially constructed concepts like time and maps provide us with contextual overlays that help us make sense of and navigate the world. In this session, we'll explore how these technologies, far from alienating us from a shared reality, actually deepen our connection to the world around us and to each other. To do that, we'll attempt to understand how both AR and VR more deeply ground us in the quote unquote real world, rather than us allowing us to somehow transcend it, blur the line between industry and academia by thinking about the ways in which this tech is historically situated, and imagine new ways for the technology we're building to make the world a better place. But first, Let's clear up some misconceptions. One common misconception is that VR is somehow escapist. The same critique that's been previously lobbed against video games and the film industry before them, and the novel before that. And just as with those early, earlier moral panics, nothing could be further from the truth. While all of these media forms do allow for a degree of fantasy wish fulfillment, they also open up new avenues for critical dialogues about social and political issues and get people to engage in these conversations more than they have in the past. There's also a conventional understanding today of VR headsets as inherently isolating, cutting us off from the world and from each other. In other words, if you can't see me, I can't see you. But the truth is that the real limits of virtual reality are determined by the bounds of your imagination. And thanks to new technologies like mixed reality and pass-through plus, we're increasingly able to break down the supposed barriers of a head-mounted display and merge virtual worlds with the one around us. And even when fully immersed in a virtual environment, we can reap the unique benefits of positive gaming communities and social VR spaces. For starters, the ability to be pseudo-anonymous. It gives us the freedom to discuss real things that matter, from personal trauma and mental health issues to disability and beyond, without fear of retribution or judgment. It also lets us try on new identi identities for an element of self-discovery. Or, as Funbit CEO Chris Millar puts it, I just enjoy that you can feel smaller, shorter, tall, large, your entire perspective changes. You also see people trying to be more than themselves. You get to rehearse in VR, and you can block people. You can't do that in real life. We can also tap into positive gaming communities and the benefits of both cooperative and competitive play. As just one example, we see with Echo VR the Hamburger Helpers, a group of seasoned players who join social lobbies to help newcomers to the game acclimate, learn skills, and feel welcomed before they start a competitive match. We also see people teaching members of the hearing community sign language in alt space. Of course, that's not to say we should all sit around wearing rose-colored glasses. 
Any community contains within itself a number of challenges, and online spaces, particularly those with elements of pseudo-anonymity, are no different. Anytime you put people together, you run into the possibility for harassment and abuse. So it's important to have tools in place to help mitigate that possibility. Blocking, bubbles of personal space, teleportation, these are all excellent um, avenues to, to pursue. So it's a balancing act between the problematics involved with online spaces and the possibility spaces that are opened up through the creation of new communities. And at the end of the day, it's worth it. So what about augmented reality? The main misconception that I see here is the idea of AR as somehow inherently techno-utopian. This is where blending academia and industry becomes particularly helpful, I think, since the translation of ut utopia is quite literally no place. In other words, it simply doesn't exist. Is it true that AR can improve our lives? Yes. Does that mean that it's inherently good? No, just as it's true that technology is never neutral nor inevitable, but rather situated within a specific cultural and historical moment. And it's our responsibility to ensure that these new technologies are designed with people in mind. Of course, we should bear more than just the human in mind. And here again, I think um, academia is particularly useful when we look at the evolution from humanism to post-humanism and to transhumanism. While humanism puts the human at the center quite literally, post-humanism seeks to break down the culture, um, the nature-culture binary, and deprivileges the human, versus transhumanism, which seeks to transcend or um, somehow overcome the benefits or the, the limitations of being human. We also see the social theory of, of disability like VR, AR has a lot of potential in that space by breaking down social barriers that people who are differently abled have to overcome in the quote unquote real world. But there's also the danger of thinking that we might somehow be able to transcend the limitations of being human, which once again reinforces the nature culture dichotomy. One of the benefits of AR then is its unique ability to draw people outside getting them out the door and into their communities. Perhaps the most ubiquitous example of this is Pokemon Go. In the words of Niantic Diversity and Inclusion Manager Trinidad Hermida, when you go outside to play, you make friends in the game. That fosters real community. And we see this borne out by the results. According to Superdata's August earnings report, Pokemon Go just had their best month for global revenue since its peak in 2016, thanks to real world events. I've been at Facebook for about three years now, and I've been continually blown away by the ability of people from all walks of life to come together around a shared love of virtual and augmented reality and the unique experiences they unlock, from gaming to art creation and beyond. We're also excited to see more and more people building their own immersive worlds inside virtual reality while millions of people use AR filters to add new layers to the moments they share with friends and loved ones. At their best, AR and VR break down physical barriers like distance or disability, as well as emotional barriers to connect people and ultimately bring them closer together. Remember, there are other worlds than these. We often think of VR and AR as two distinct computing platforms, though they really form two sides of the same coin. Virtual reality lets us inhabit fully digital worlds and immerse ourselves in digital content, while augmented reality takes virtual objects and adds them to our perception of the real world for an enhanced experience of the everyday. Taken together, these technologies stand to reinvent the way we connect with the world around us and with each other. Together, AR and VR open the space for us to imagine a future that's radically different than the present, one where we can connect with others in a deep and meaningful way, no matter where in the world they happen to be. And as the technology slowly begins to deliver on that promise, new communities will continue to spring up in its wake. We're honored to continue fostering those communities and their growth alongside all of you. 
And now I'd like for this talk to become a conversation. So if anyone has questions or thoughts that they'd like to share, I'd be more than happy to chat with you in the speaker pavilion just outside. Thank you.